So what does this do? Does this index into the array? Oh no, that would be way too easy. What it actually does is call the addPOS method on the object that we're indexing into. Now addPOS receives individual indexes. So all of the, uh, the slicing is factored out into the operator. And that means if you're implementing a custom array type, you only have to implement addPOS, which is pretty nice. And that's why it's done that way. Then, uh, this actually finally does the thing that you would expect an array indexing operation to do, which is, you know, look up the element and return it. And, oh yeah, we have to do something with auto vivification as well uh, if the element doesn't exist yet. Okay. But what about looping over lines in the file? Surely that is, uh, that's easier. Ah, it must be. Okay. So we do it as a for loop and uh, that uses the iterator API. So we get hold of an iterator object and we call pull one on it repeatedly to pull one line out of the file. Uh, so that's a method call on the iterator. But what does that method do? Well, it goes off to the current decoder, okay, which is doing say the UTF-8 decoding or something and says I want to consume the characters of one line. And uh, this encoding, uh, some of them we've, we've written uh, down in the VM. Um, some of them you can actually plug in from user space and uh, write your own encodings. So that's a method call as well. Uh, we get some, uh, sometimes we, we run out of bytes to decode and then we have to go off to the file system and actually do the reading from the file. Then we finally get a string and then the body of the loop is a block because four really compiles into something a little bit like map and we have to invoke that uh, and pass the line as an argument to it. This also sounds like quite a bit of work. Uh, all of these darn calls, okay? It's call, 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 method call all the time. In a language where method resolution is something you can plug and override, uh, where type checking is also pluggable, because why not? Uh, where we have continuation powerful constructs, where stack frames uh, are introspectable first class objects, where a mix in can change the type of anything at a distance, and where we have things like leave handlers on frames and so on. Uh, ouch. Okay, so uh, what do we do? Uh, well, let's see. So first I'll just step back a bit and talk about the compiler architecture. So you get your source code, you throw it at, uh, at the Perl 6 uh, compiler, um, and what the compiler's job is, is to produce bytecode for some virtual machine. And today I'll focus on the more VM, which is the one we've built specially for Pulse 6. That source code uh, is fed through the compiler. Uh, so it goes into the grammar, which deals in the syntax and parsing. Uh, it then goes through actions uh, as part of that. And the actions build up a tree of what we call abstract, synt abstract syntax tree nodes. And that describes what the program should do. So, you know, in Perl 6, there's lots of ways to write, say, a pair, but all of them compile into the same looking tree, okay? And uh, then we turn that tree into code, uh, and that's what we can run. So that's roughly what goes on. So just how do a few things work with this? Uh, one of the interesting things about this architecture is the compiler itself is just a Perl 6 program. Uh, it just runs on top of the VM, the same as your program does. Uh, so that means that when we run things like scripts and one-liners, the compiler is just run in memory, it produces the code, we run it. Uh, so we don't ever have to write it to disk. When we have modules, we cache the bytecode on disk. That sounds really easy. It turns out to be really hard to engineer it well. Uh, thankfully, that's not something that I have to worry about too much. Uh, so I'm very glad to have, have got someone dealing with that. Uh, and eval, uh, eval is actually pretty easy in Perl 6 because the compiler is just some more Perl 6 code. So eval just calls that code uh, and uh, then runs what it produces. Uh, it, it puts some interesting problem constraints on us, like code has to be possible to garbage collect after you've evaluated it and so on. Okay, so that's roughly how the, the high level bit of the compiler works. What next? Well, uh, actually I kind of lied about this. Uh, there's actually another little step in here, uh, which uh, is the, the AST optimizer. So at this point, we, we do some limited optimization work. So we do things like constant folding. So if you write one plus one, we'll rewrite it into two because why not? Uh, we, we do some uh, 
<laughs> it wasn't meant to be that funny. Um, so, so then we'll do some, uh, what we call lexical to local lowering. So lots of things you think of as my scoped lexical variables, but actually you never close over them in a closure. And uh, actually we, if we know that they're not gonna be closed over, the program gets a lot easier to analyze. So in some cases, we'll get more aggressive at this in the future, we actually take them and turn them into what we call local variables, uh, and that, that just makes life a bit easier. When we see we have natively typed operators, like a native integer plus another native integer, then we just inline that operation. That is, we instead of making a multi-dispatch, we figure it out as we compile, and we just put a very simple add instruction in there, um, and we do various little small scale tree rewritings where we say, had ah, this construct actually would be cheaper if it was that. So a very simple example is junctions. If you write the junction syntax, so you say if $A equals uh, one or two with the single vertical bar, uh, then uh, actually, oh, I'll write it somewhere. Um, yeah, if, if, if you write, there we go. Okay, finally. Uh, if you write dollar $A is uh, one or two, it's okay, I found a, a place. Okay, now if you look at what that naively compiled into, this one or two actually would compile into something like, oh wow, yes, I really should have installed readline on this laptop. Uh, this, okay which actually turns into a, a new call on a junction. So it makes an object, and then the operator threads through the object, and that's quite a lot of work. So what the optimizer actually does for you is it rewrites the code into something like um, or. Wow. Uh, or that. But it actually also does a trick to make sure it only really reads $A once. So if it was a complicated expression, it wouldn't evaluate it twice. And uh, then this works out quite a lot faster. So we do lots, lots of little bits of small scale tree rewriting, but none of that actually helps with uh, the, the other stuff that I talked about before, where we have all of these different method calls to do. So you might have heard this saying before. This is a fairly popular saying in the, uh, the compiler world. Okay, don't put off until runtime, which that's which you could do at compile time. Hmm. But uh, for scripts and one-liners, the language user doesn't really have a separate runtime and compile time. If you run a Perl script, the, the time is just time. You don't really think about where it starts compiling and starts running. But also, one of the, the things about you know, any code, in a, in a, even, not even necessarily in a dynamic language, this is true in general, uh, you don't always know much about how it's going to be used. So, we don't know, for example, where to spend time optimizing. And uh, we don't know stuff between modules that we might want to optimize as well. One of the big insights, though, is that we're not limited to one compile time. Okay? So just-in-time compilers do a second phase of it later. So I've kind of refactored that saying into only do in this compile time something that you can't do better in a future compile time. Okay? And that gives you quite a bit more freedom. So, known unknowns, okay? So, uh, one of the interesting things if we actually study Perl 6 code and think about compiling it uh, is there's a lot of, of things that we don't know at the point that we just look at the code. Here is a, uh, a pretty simple example. This is a subroutine that uh, will compute the average number of characters on a line uh, by going through all the lines in the file. So, it receives some handle there. Uh, it, uh, we then just increment these, uh, the number of lines, the number of chars. Uh, we loop over this, this handle here. We do a division here, okay? And uh, what don't we know? Uh, we don't know the types of parameters, okay? We don't know what type of thing we're getting there. Uh, we don't know, therefore, the, the types of things we're calling methods on. So we, we have to resolve that at uh, runtime. Uh, we, uh, we don't know the types of operators as a result. We, uh, we, with this, this, I guess we, with this one we do, okay, because it's an integer and we can figure it out. But we don't actually know what line.chars will return. I mean, we do as a programmer, 
Okay, we would probably be very surprised if asking for the number of characters returned a complex number. But, char but chars is just a method. In the abstract, we don't actually know what type that is, handle, so we don't know what type that is, line, so we don't actually know what chars is. It could be, it could be anything. You could, you could write an April Fool's you know, line iterator that uh, gives you strings that have complex characters or something. I don't know. Uh, but uh, we, we don't know that. And you might say, what if we start writing type annotations? Doesn't that help? And the answer is not really, because actually anything could be subclassed. So we could actually have a subtype that overrides the char method. Uh, but also because we have mix-ins, any value can be mixed into and given a new method override. So you know, if I, if I call line.chars, the chars method could actually mix into line, okay, which would be crazy, but in general, this is something we have to worry about. So even if we know its type here, by the next line of code, its type might have changed. Okay, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is fun. Um, and if we get past the closure, uh, we don't know what code is going to be invoked as the callback. If in a module, um, we might actually, if we, we have a module where we take a callback, it might be the same callback every time in a certain program, but in other programs it might vary. Uh, so you know, that, that's tricky. Um, but even simple things we don't know. For example, we might see a loop and we might say, should we invest lots of time optimizing this loop? How to know? We don't know if it will be intensively used or if it will do two iterations and that's the end of the program. Okay? And if it's a one-liner or some quick little thing, there's no point investing lots of analysis. It'll just slow us down and you know, doing a quick run of the program. So basically, we don't know what to spend effort optimizing. And even if we did, we don't actually know what to optimize it for anyway, uh, which seems like a bit of a hopeless situation. But uh, dynamic problem? Dynamic solution, okay? So uh, here's what we actually do to try and deal with this. So when we start running the bytecode that's compiled in more VM, we interpret it, okay? So an interpreter is just like a loop and it has instructions like look up this lexical, add these two numbers together, uh, read this thing from a scalar, uh, index this, this array, and so forth. Uh, now, what we do in a load of the different instructions that are interesting type-wise is we log the types that we see. This is done into an append-only buffer. So every entry in this log is about 24 bytes long. We just have a big blob of memory, okay? And every time we see, say, a parameter or an argument or a, uh, an invocant or a lexical lookup, an attribute lookup, we just make logs into this buffer. And with time, the buffer gets full, we get to the end, and uh, then we take that buffer and we, we throw it off into a queue. And one of the things that we do to make this cheap is we don't try and record information about the call stack, but every call we make carries an ID. And that allows us to do a simulation later and put it all back together. So we have a queue. These buffers of logged type info end up in there. And then we have another thread that is pulling things out of the queue and doing optimization. So that, this is one of the nice things we do in more VM. We actually optimize on a background thread. So your code continues running at normal speed um, or you know, normal interpreted speed. We optimize in the background and then later we replace your code with a, an optimized version of it. We'll talk about that in a bit. So then it takes these uh, buffers of data and it runs a simulation uh, of the program, saying what does it call, when do we make these calls, uh, what types are there, uh, and it builds up a load of statistics. So if you get it to log what it comes up with, uh, then you'll get a load of stats out. So let's uh, take a look at the program. This program is just doing, uh, okay, we open a file, we count the number of characters in the file, uh, and then we just close the file. Okay, so sim simple little thing. So what does this compile into? Well, remember I said that doing a for loop over the lines in a file, uh, this, is, this is a fine way to do it in Perl 6 because of laziness, calls pull one. 
Okay, pull one looks like this. It takes the decoder, it tries to consume characters, and if it fails to, then it does a slow path thing, which actually might do some I.O., and uh, otherwise we, uh, we hit the end of the loop. <coughs> so for the chars method, I get a log like this, okay? So it says this is statistics for the chars method that comes from the, the string source file in Perl 6. Uh, it uh, got called 468 times so far. Actually, it's always called with an object, and the object is always a string, and it's always concrete. For the plus operator, okay, this got called 469 times since we started logging. Uh, it always is called with two object arguments, and they are always uh, a <laughs> scalar that contains an int and an int. Okay, and if we look at the program, uh, that makes sense. Okay, a scalar containing an int and an int. Okay, so that's where, where that comes from. Uh, other times, we, uh, we find things that aren't so hot. So read internal is the thing that actually reads data off the disk into a buffer. This isn't hot yet, okay? It's only been seen once. So we know that this isn't worth investing any time optimizing yet. Other things get more interesting. Uh, this one is pretty hot. It's been called 475 times. That's, that's a lot of times. But uh, if we look at what it was called with, this is a d defined method, by the way. Uh, it's sometimes called on a scalar holding uh, an any. Uh, that only happened once, though. That's, that's not really worth optimizing for. It actually gets called on a string type object as well. That's also not very interesting. Uh, it's called once on an int. That's also just once. That's, that's not. But loads and loads of calls on a, on a string. Okay, so that, that seems like a, uh, a good place to spend our time. The loop body itself, uh, okay, that gets called lots of times with a, a string. And uh, actually, if we look inside the statistic records, there's actually information about what happens in this loop body as well. So these offsets here correspond to positions in the bytecode, that is the low-level stream of instructions. And this, all this is saying is, you know, this instruction saw a scalar uh, that was, uh, yeah, that's all it saw. Uh, this one saw a string. Uh, here we have a call, okay? This one says that uh, we, we get a, uh, a type int back from the call. We call this particular method, having resolved it, and we always pass it a string. So what we end up with is lots and lots of statistics about how the program behaves. And then we take those statistics and we use them to do some planning. So the planning stage is deciding which things are hot and what should we spend time optimizing. So one of the things that's also a factor in this is the bigger a chunk of code is, the more effort it is to analyze and optimize. So we actually have thresholds that code based on its size has to pass. So if it's a really small method or a really small subroutine uh, and it gets, you know, say 100 hits or something, we might say, ah, it's not much work to optimize it. Let's do it. Uh, if on the other hand, it's, it's, you know, like a whole four or five kilobytes of byte code and uh, it only got called 100 times so far, it's like, uh, there's better things to do now. So we put it off until a bit later. One of the really interesting notions that we're trying to figure out here is the idea of how morphic something is, okay? Probably everyone's heard the word polymorphism, okay? Which is uh, where we talk about code working on a range of different types. Uh, but there's actually three other kinds of ways that we, or three total kinds of ways we talk about code. We might say code is monomorphic. Monomorphic means that we encounter pretty much the same type all the time. Okay, so, and, and this is not specific to an operation, this is context as well. So in a particular run of the program, we might say that the chars method is monomorphic because it always gets called on a string. Okay, that's always how it is. Uh, some things are polymorphic. They get called on a few different types of thing, 
There's not that much variance, and we might as well produce optimized versions for each. And then we have megamorphic things, and those are the things that are a complete nightmare. Uh, basically, they, they encounter dozens or a hundred different types. And uh, of course, if we go and try to produce you know, specialized versions or try to analyze every one, then we're going to end up with in incredible memory use uh, in producing you know, optimized versions of code. So we try and classify things. So when we see it's monomorphic, uh, then, you know, we, we say, well, okay, that is something that is worth spending time on. We also have a, you know, a sort of sloppy monomorphic, where we say, well, 99% of the time, uh, it is always a string. And then, you know, 1% of the time, it's something else. So let's optimize it for the 99% the case. Um, polymorphic, you know, we say, okay, there's a few different types. Let's optimize it for most of them. And anything that is not so common, we'll, we'll just ignore. Okay, and megamorphic, uh, there's, there's not so much we can do with it. So if you look at a, uh, a specializer log and uh, look at what comes after the statistics, you'll actually see a plan. And the plan is what it plans to optimize. So here we see for the infix plus operator that adds two things together, we're going to optimize it for the case where it receives an int it receives a scalar as the first parameter containing an int, okay? And then down here, it has an explanation of why it thinks this is worth optimizing, okay? So it actually tries to tell, me, tell us why it's doing things. A much earlier version of the specializer didn't really give us this feedback, so we'd always have to look at what it did and say, why on earth did it do that? Okay, and now it's really nice because we can actually look at the plan and see what it decided to do and why. Here is one of those examples, and it's a 98%, okay? So we say it's monomorphic-ish. Uh, it's almost always uh, this defined method called on a string. Uh, that's enough for us to say it's worthwhile. So what we do at this point is we generate specialized versions of the code, assuming that's what they are receiving. And that lets us strip out lots of checks. Okay, and as I said, megamorphic, uh, we can still do some things about them, but generally not so much. One of the things that's on the, the hit list for the future, by the way, is to deal with subroutines or methods that are monomorphic or polymorphic in one argument and megamorphic in the other one. And at the moment, we don't really detect that, uh, but there's a bunch of places where actually we could do really well if we could detect that. Um, so that's, that's something for the, the future. So it's not actually quite as simple as, uh, as those three. Okay, so we've decided to optimize something. Uh, what do we do? Uh, we make a specialization graph. Okay, so I'll go quickly through this. Um, what we do is we take bytecode and we turn it into a form that we can work with easily for optimization. And the first thing we do is break it into a set of what we call basic blocks. And a basic block is a set of instructions with no flow control between them. So one of the really tricky things about compiling Perl 6 is that actually lots of things that you would hope don't actually invoke or don't cause flow control really do. Um, so if I take a look at this code here, okay, this here, this decont instruction, means read a value from a scalar, which you would hope wouldn't actually end up calling code, but in Perl 6 can because the, the fetch method uh, might actually have been uh, used on, say, a proxy, where you can control what happens when we read the scalar. Think of it a little bit like tying or something like that. You might hope that checking the type of something might not call code, and often it won't. It will just look in a cache and say, oh, it matches. But if the programmer is using some kind of pluggable type system, yeah, it might call code. Um, checking that we have the correct parameter, yeah, that might, that might call in some error handling routine. Uh, that's a decont again. So actually, we end up with lots of these very tiny little basic blocks uh, of things that, that might invoke. Um, so yeah, OK, that's what I told you. So uh, what we then do is put these into a graph. So I get something that looks like this. Okay, and this is nice because we can see this is a conditional. Okay, this is like an if, then, else. Okay, and then we join back up again. Where we go from here back to here again, that's a loop. Okay, and you can just follow all of the, the ways we might go through this. 
so that gets us a graph, okay, like this. And uh, that's pretty useful, but it's not actually that useful on its own. Uh, because, uh, you know, it, it tells us where we might come from, it tells us where we might go to, but it doesn't tell us enough about how data flows through the program. So, actually I'll skip over that because that's not, not quite so interesting. So what I want to talk about is this, okay? So this is the principle of dominance. So we also calculate uh, something called a dominance tree. Now, uh, a basic block dominates another one if every path to the second one goes through the first. So for example, basic block one here dominates everything. Why? Well, because to reach everything else, you must go through it, okay? And uh, basic block two is pretty much the same, okay? To get to any of these, you have to go through it. Everything dominates itself by definition. Uh, and then these two only dominate themselves, okay? Uh, this one uh, dominates this. So, okay, so we end up with this, uh, this dominance uh, graph as well. So then we have strict dominance, which is easy. That means everything that dominates something but not itself. Okay, so we just throw away all of the identities there. And then we have a concept of immediate dominance, which is where we dominate a block, but it's not strictly dominated by somebody else. And uh, that is the, uh, what I've underlined it here. Okay, those are the strict dominators. And one of the things that's kind of nice about this is it turns out that it's not a graph, it's a tree. And actually this tree tells us what order we can usefully visit these things in, in order to uh, uh, be seeing data flow most of the time uh, before it, uh, it gets, uh, essentially we see writes before reads is, is what, I, what I really want to say about it. Okay, so, uh, that makes a tree that's kind of useful, okay? So there, there I've drawn the tree on there in the, uh, the black dotted lines. But what uh, is actually really useful about this, okay, is that uh, it lets us do what I call single static assignment form. What this means is that we can take code like this and you'll notice that this is an instruction that gets an integer parameter, okay, required parameter integer. And you'll notice that we actually receive those, but then we reuse the register here, okay? So we multiply it by itself and store the result. Now this is kind of tricky uh, because we, you know, we're, we're reusing these and it's a bit hard to reason about them that way, but what we can do is we can give everyone a version number. So this is uh, using version one of R0, okay? This is uh, version two. This uses version two of it and so forth. And uh, when we do this, cool, 10 minutes, okay? When we do this, uh, it gets a lot easier to understand the data types in the program because everything is only ever written to once, okay? Now, of course, control flow, is a bit of a problem. Uh, this is actually why we need the dominance tree. Um, because if you look at this, okay, you say if R2, go to basic block three here, but otherwise we'll go here, and you'll notice that this sets R0, uh, this path here doesn't, so what version do we have there? And the answer is, we version them like that. Okay, what should we, what number goes there? Mm -hmm. we introduce a, a, a phi function, okay, which is a pretend instruction that merges the, uh, the incoming values, like that. So what use is this for? Because this doesn't exist when you actually compile the program, okay, that goes away again, it's just a pretend, it's like a figment of the optimizer's imagination. But what it means is that we can take these, okay, and we place them using dominance. That is why dominance is so important. Uh, and we can actually use them to join up different facts as well. So for example, uh, what we can see is that we get, for example, information that on one side of the, uh, the condition, this thing is an int. On the other side of the condition, it's an int. 
So the result, no matter which way we go through that tree, must be some kind of int. And there's lots of different little facts we track, not just about type, but also about definedness and so on. And uh, for each of those joins, we have what we call a lattice, which is a mathematical construct where you always move up, okay? So if we have int and int, we can stay there. But if we have int and string, we have to move up the lattice to unknown. And uh, you might realize that inheritance hierarchies, I guess, also form a lattice. So this is how we, we reason about these things. Okay, so join int int goes to int. Join int string goes to this top unknown thing. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. That's all well and good, you might say, but where do the facts come from? Where does all of this type information come from? The statistics. Okay, so this is where we put the pieces together. Because I mentioned before that we log lots of statistics about what sorts of types we see. Now, if we're in a static language, we do all of this analysis, but we take the types from the, the program. But when we're in a, a more dynamic situation, okay, then what we're doing is recording the types we see, and then we're using them as if they were the truth. And you might say, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Statistics are statistics. They're not mathematical proofs. They just say what things tend to be. Okay? They're not a proof that it always will be that way. We do in some places manage to do proofs in uh, the optimizer, but most of the time we, we just have some stats. Okay? So what do we do? Well, here is where the title of the talk is explained. What we do is we insert guard instructions. A guard instruction is something that very quickly checks that the type that we expect according to the statistics actually shows up. So what happens if it isn't? We deoptimize. Okay. So deoptimization is a technique that enables speculation. That is, it enables us to say the statistics think it's always this type. So let's assume it is, and if it isn't, then we'll deoptimize. What does deoptimize mean? It means that we fall back to the slow interpreted path of the code and let it handle those cases. Now, if, it, if those other cases turn out to be popular enough, the interpreter will log lots of statistics about them, and eventually we'll end up optimizing for those as well. Now, one of the interesting things that means is that uh, Anything that we have an optimization for, we have to have the reverse optimization for. Uh, so, for example, if we try and do dead code elimination, we have to make sure that we don't eliminate things that we might still need when we deoptimize. Um, one of the other really tricky ones, and this one is a really big headache, we inline things. Okay, so when we make a call and it's small, we take that code and we copy it into the caller, but we have to be able to undo the inlining when we deoptimize. So we actually implemented uninlining as well, uh, which is uh, a little bit of a headache. But generally, we win a lot from this, okay? Because guards are a lot cheaper than the instructions that they replace. And also, normally, we take a value and we do lots and lots of things with it. But if we can guard its type in one place, all of those dynamic checks for it can go away. We also actually have a second case of deoptimization. I mentioned that mix-ins can happen at a distance. Okay, we can pass an argument somewhere. Um, when that happens, it actually triggers what we call a global deoptimization. And then we actually unwind all of the, de all of the optimizations we've done uh, that might have depended on that. So by now, we have some optimized version of the code. Okay, we're ready to run it. How do we get there? Uh, how do we get from the interpreter to this specialized and maybe machine code compiled version of the optimized code? There's two ways. One of them is when we call into a method or a subroutine, we take the incoming argument types, we feed them into a data structure called a guard tree, and it tells us which optimized version to use. The second way 
is called on stack replacement. This happens when you're in a tight loop and the loop is running, okay? And at some point we see, uh, ah, this is a hot loop. We make an optimized version of the code. Now when we're interpreting at the end of each loop, we do a very quick little check saying, is there an optimized version of this loop available? And if there is, we jump from the interpreter into either a faster version or into a machine code compiled version of the code. So we can actually rip your loop in the middle of itself might actually transition from interpreter to JIT compiled just as part of the looping. One of the other neat things that gives us is I mentioned that we might handle the 99% case. Imagine you're in a loop, okay? We optimize it for the 99% case. Then you get to the 1% case and we de-optimize. What happens? Do we run the rest of the loop slow? Turns out, no, we run it slow long enough. Then we spot at the end of the loop that there's a specialization. Then we jump back into the optimized version again. So actually in a lot of those situations, your code pings between the optimized version most of the time and the interpreter some of the time for the rare cases. We also do tricks like linking specializations. So if a specialization uh, calls another one, we don't have to redo all the checks, we lift them out. Uh, the best case of that is inlining where we don't even make a call, we just copy the code we're calling into the caller and sometimes that's even less code in the end anyway because it doesn't have all the argument passing instructions. Okay. So we made it. Okay, that, that is how deoptimization uh, is a technique that lets us speculate uh, based on statistics about how we should optimize code optimize it and then get away with it in the few cases where we guess wrong. And uh, that's the stuff that we are uh, doing in uh, more VM today. So every time you run a Perl 6 program, uh, this is the stuff that is going on underneath to uh, madly try and run your program faster. Okay, so uh, that's all. I think I've used all my time maybe. So uh, yeah, I don't yeah, want to make us late. Five minutes late. So if yeah. you have questions. Okay. Oh, the other track's late. Okay. So, okay. All the optimization and the, the things you prepare in the background, um, could you cache it and use it for a, a, a future run, or is it just thrown away and uh, you do it every time you use it? It's thrown away, um, and I, I guess the interesting question is lifetime of it. Uh, you know, you might say, could we just cache it for a particular module? Uh, but what happens if the module that we were to cache that information for is used from a second script and the types it uses in the module and passes into the module are completely different. So then you'd have to figure out how to do it at a script level. Um, and, you know, and then you'd be assuming that uh, every run of the program gets the same kind of data and takes the same program paths. So you know, then it's not even centric on the program code, it's centric on the program usage. So it becomes very um, interesting to, to try and figure out, you know, what is the right way to do that? Uh, it may be faster to measure it. One of the things that I would like to see us do at some point though, is actually cache specializations that are common. Uh, because the statistics bit isn't really the expensive thing. The expensive thing is doing the optimization once we have gathered the statistics uh, and, you know, having that part done and cached could be pretty beneficial. So, yeah, please. Um, assuming you have a sub uh, and you call the sub with two different types of data, so, yep. so it might add out with the two um, different types of optimization. Yes. Uh, does it mean as soon as you call the sub with a different type of data, you throw away the current optimization, do the de-optimization, use no, actually, actually what it does is it stacks up a, uh, a, 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 a what we call a guard tree. Uh -huh. So when you do the, when you hit the third case, if it gets popular enough, then it will notice there's a third case and it will produce an optimized version for the third one. And then it will just chain it onto the set of guards. So it will, you know, it, it's like a little tree saying, okay, is it an int? Okay, take this version. Is it a string? Take this version. Is it a, you know, a rational take this version? So, so yeah, it doesn't throw away old optimizations. It, it just adds extra ones as possibilities. Thanks. Yep. Okay.
Anything else? All right, thank you.